four of our analytics, data science, and artificial intelligence class. I am glad you're here today. Okay, so this should be kind of a follow-on from chapter three. So make sure you review chapter three along the way. Make sure that you take a look at our case study for the Miami-Dade Police Department, because it's really kind of interesting on how data mining can do some really interesting things along the way. And Miami-Dade did some really interesting predictive policing that really caused some interesting problems and really solved some interesting solutions as well along the way. So we're going to cover some data mining concepts and discovering our mining knowledge from large amounts of data. So the idea behind that is you have a big pool of data, whether it's a data lake, a data pool, something else, just a huge big pile of data. And then whether it's structured, semi-structured, unstructured, it depends on what you've got and you need to do something with it. And you've got all these tools around you to help you mine that data, help you get to where you need to go with it, help you make better decisions, manage it, uh, learn from it, and then manage the data warehouse itself, and then information visualization, because how we present the data is equally as important. So data mining applications, right? When we're using this, we can do this across multiple verticals, multiple industries, right? Customer service, banking, retailing and logistics, manufacturing and production, brokerage, insurance, government and defense, travel and healthcare. So the interesting part is how we use this, right? So healthcare is actually really straightforward. We can do it for community healthcare. We can do it for um, my local record, um, whatever is going on with, with the Department of Health. Um, it depends on where you are in the problem, right? If whether you're looking at it from a global viewpoint or whether you're looking at it from a local viewpoint, a national viewpoint, your healthcare and data mining applications can be really interesting, especially with the reporting requirements that go up. So hospitals have to report how many cases of what every day to the government, just so they can actually track what's going on in healthcare. Travel can be equally as interesting. Expedia and Travelocity know where people are going, right? So if I'm gonna go take a trip to Saudi Arabia, then I know that my travel is going to be part of that. So that means Expedia or Travelocity or whoever I book through now knows that I'm going to Saudi Arabia. Well, how many other people are going to go to Saudi Arabia in this time frame? And if I know how many people in that, well, what kind of airlines fly there? How should airlines um, be capacity planning, right? Based on what people are actually booking. That's a neat data mining application right there because then it can help the travel agency and the airline become much more effective. It can help a country understand where people want to go and why they want to go there, whether I'm going for business or for fun, and then start catering to the kind of visitor that you want to have, right? Insurance, same thing. Insurance, how many people in a zip code, how many people have floods, fire. There's an entire actual aerial table in insurance that goes along with that. So data mining applications of the actual actuarial table in insurance is big. You know, we all have that for life insurance, house insurance, car insurance, and all the other insurances that we've got. It's all based on an actuarial table, and that's all easily data mined based on zip code and in some places down to the actual physical address. Brokerage, same thing. We're going to do predictive modeling on where we think the stock market's going to go today. What is the price of gold, silver, oil? We can predict things. So brokerage is also huge when it comes to that. Retailing and logistics is huge. Banking, and again, all this stuff works. All of this stuff has got some very specific and discrete data mining applications that can go along with it that you should be aware of and know how to use in that process. So each one of these is unique and they all have different things that you can do with it and they all really offer some interesting things that you can tie some of this stuff together, right? So if I book a travel to Saudi Arabia, I'm gonna fly on this airline, so K um, KLM and then Saudi Air, know that I'm going to be on their plane. Well, if they tied that back to my health care, I have to go get all these shots now for travel to Saudi Arabia because I don't know what my, my shot records are, but my doctor does. So I can go tell my doctor, hey, I'm going to be going to Saudi Arabia. What shots do I need to have? What kind of vaccines do I need to have? Or what should I know medical-wise? Or um, should I go get some prescriptive dental care before I go there for four months? right? Because it's going to be a long trip. Those are the kinds of things that if you start tying all these data points together, that really works. Now I can tell my bank because there's a little flip on my app that, well, I can tell them if I'm going to be traveling, right? So that if all of a sudden they see me using my credit card in Saudi Arabia, they know that I'm going to be there, 
right? So I can tie my banking together. I'm going to have to go buy a, a burner computer, right? A, a travel computer because my laptop broke. So retailing, my that should be getting ads for like, hey Dan, do you need a new, new computer? How about data access for your phone? AT and T offers this cool service, 50 gigs for 9.99 a month. Blah blah blah, right? So if you tie my travel together with my healthcare, my retailing, logistics, my banking. Um, my insurance, I may need travel insurance. I may need healthcare insurance while I'm there, right? That's another thing. You could tie this whole thing into a big package to make my trip to Saudi Arabia comfortable, easy going, with all the things I need to have, uh, medically cleared, dentally cleared, with a nice computer, a good phone that will tie into the Saudi network, uh, all that stuff. And all I have to do is book a flight. I like that kind of data mining application. Now, for some people, that may be super creepy. But for me, it'd be like, oh, good, someone's going to take care of all this stuff and give me a checklist of things I need to do to be ready to go. So it depends on how you look at it. But that's a data mining application I would actually really appreciate right now, right? So there's some data mining processes you should be aware of, CRISP and SEMA, right? So there's some really good ways of taking a look at it, and the book has got two really good graphics on it. So for CRISP DM, you know, your business understanding, your data understanding, data preparation, model building, testing and evaluation, and then deployment, right? So you really do want to make sure that you, again, go back, understand your data, clean it, make sure it's ready to go, uh, make sure you understand what's in the data, and then build your models, and then go ahead and test and evaluate to make sure your models are realistic. And then under SEMA, sample, explore, modify, model, and assess. Same kind of process, but this one has a feedback loop in it that makes sure that all the processes are, are looping back into each other to make sure that you're accurate at all steps. Um, for sampling, make sure your sampling rate is accurate or needed for what you're doing because what you're doing may be different, right? If you're doing telemetry for launching rockets, you need a sampling rate at the millisecond level. If you're doing assembly line, you probably need sampling rate at the second level. If you're doing power usage at my house, you probably only need hourly sampling. So make sure that your sampling is at the right level when you're doing SEMA to give you that opportunity to explore that data and make sure that when you're modifying it and you're modeling it, that the sampling rate is correct. That's a really good difference between CRISP and SEMA and understanding how these two models actually work right? One is geared more towards this pretty static data. The other one is geared more towards data that's sampled and on the fly. So know when to use these as well. It's kind of a neat way of looking at how to do data. CRISP, something we're doing every day, but SEMA is more for sampling, maybe IoT, maybe sensor data, maybe weather data, or other kinds of data. Make sure your sampling rate is at the right level for what kind of data you're trying to do. And then there's some data mining methods you want to be aware of, classification, and then estimating the true accuracy of your classification models. All right, bias, we've talked about bias, we've talked about dirty data, and we've talked about clean data. And you wanna make sure that when you start getting into your true observed classes and your predicted classes that you have a true positive count or a false positive count and negative counts false. So this is one way of making sure that your classification of data is actually really accurate. And you wanna make sure that you're true positive as much as you can be, right, for your classes, and how they work. Now there is actual math. Um, you don't need to know the math for the test. You just need to know that the math exists and what kind of math happens for accuracy, true positive, true negative, precision, and recall. The ones I would be really particularly interested in are accuracy, the ratio of correctly classified instances, positives and negatives, divided by the total number of instances, right? Because accuracy matters. If you have a sampling rate with a 10% error rate in it, then your accuracy is going to be off by 10%. And 10% in some things can be a huge deviation off the normal for your deviation chart, whether that's one or two deviations off the norm. So your accuracy really matters when it comes down to what you're doing and how you're doing it and where it is. I want a near 100% accuracy rate if you're going to diagnose me with a disease. right? I can accept a 10% deviation on the accuracy rate if it's something like my driving habits. Right, especially if it's a if it's a false positive, right? It says Dan stop hitting the brakes so hard, right? So precision matters depending on what it is. The ratio of correctly classified positives divided by the sum of correctly classified positives and incorrectly classified positives. Depends on where we are. 
those are really going to be your two big ones that are going to define how this works. Now, you can also do recall um, as part of it because you really do want that ratio of correctly classified positives divided by a sum of correctly classified positives, right? So recall and precision go well in hand right, for each other, but really estimating the accuracy of the classification models will help you reduce bias because bias is a problem. I'm going to talk about bias all the way through this because bias can really be a problem when it comes down to how we do things in the world and how those processes are going to work and how accurate our data models are going to be and how much we're going to be able to manage those data models with people and events and problems, especially when we're going to get into predictive modeling, especially when we're going to get into social issues like how many people will graduate college, how many people need this level of police enforcement, how many people need this level of food stamps, how many people need this level of multi-million mansions, right? It matters. It really does matter. Those biases really matter. So we're going to be talking about that all the way through this class. So there's some classification techniques you can use. You should be pretty familiar with some of these, like the decision tree analysis, that's something that we use all the time in statistical analysis. If you've ever used Excel, you've done a statistical analysis along the way, um, whether that is qualitative or quantitative data, depending on how you coded it, a lot of things happen for statistical analysis. They happen in Excel or some other kind of program that's suited for that. Now, there's some other things, too, that can be done through neural networks or case-based reasoning. Um, neural networks present some really interesting problems because um, you can actually branch the decision making process a whole lot. It starts to get messy really quick, but it can also be really accurate really quick. Case based reasoning is a little bit more interesting. You'll see us using case based reasoning all the way through this. You'll see use cases like Miami Dade or Coin or someone else, right? And that if it worked for one company, it may work for you. And that's actually really reasonable, especially when you get into something like the hospitality industry, you get into restaurants, you get into bars, you get into things like that where the, the consumer had a problem and this is how that problem was solved. You can probably use that same solution in some other place. Then you've got some Bayesian classifiers, genetic algorithms and rough sets that you can work with as well. So Bayesian classifiers are different. Genetic algorithms are another process where you will cover here in a little bit and then rough sets along the way. So when you get into data mining software and tools, there's a whole lot of them. So SPSS, man, I think everyone's used it. If you have ever worked in any kind of modeling for a college, for a dissertation, you're going to use SPSS. <laughs> it really does work. It's really kind of neat. Um, Watson Analytics is another one um, that really is kind of interesting that you can use, but a lot of it's pre-canned. You're not going to be able to go in there and cut your own data points or anything else. There's some enterprise miners that you can use, Dell Statistica, Polyanalysis, CART, Random Forest. Again, just a lot of these. Um, Ghost Miner is interesting to use. SQL, Server Data Mining, along with Power BI, um, Tableau, um, Cognos, and others are also in there. Um, Teradata Warehouse Miners, there's a bunch of other miners that are native to the cloud. So native to Google, native to Amazon, native to Azure along the way. But there are other products that you can use. It depends on what you want to buy. It depends on where you are in terms of understanding how um, these tools work. You may want to go with something you're more comfortable with. So again, SPSS, I've been using that for a long time, super long time. It's a tool I'm really comfortable with. So I may choose to use that for some data mining things, but I'm also really super comfortable with what's going on in the cloud right now. And I can cut some pretty good dashboards based on what's going on in a data warehouse there. So those are two skills and techniques that I've learned that really will make a difference in how I manage stuff. So I don't need a whole lot of product here. So if you if the company goes out and buys um, something like Zen Mendes predictive analysis or something else, I'll learn how to use it. But in the meantime, I'm still probably going to be using my own techniques and my own process along the way. Now, there's some data mining privacy issues, myths and blunders. So this is actually really kind of interesting when you get into what the myth and the reality is, because sometimes your management or, or other people are working on the myth where the reality is really something different, or they may be working on the reality and not really quite understanding where other people are coming from because other people in the group are working off the myth. So there's the myth that data mining provides instant crystal ball life predictions, and that is not true. Data mining is a multi-step process that requires deliberate, proactive design and use, and you have to be really intentional about what you do with data mining. There is no way if ands, buts about it. You have to be intentional about everything you do in here and understand what's in the data. The myth 
data mining is not yet viable for mainstream business applications. You know, the current state of the art is really good. It's actually ready for almost any kind of business type and or size. It's just a matter now of integrating it into the workflow for the company. And then what kind of data does the company actually have available to it? So those are really the two big ones. Can I put it in a workflow? And does the company have access to the amount of data that they're gonna to need to actually make a data mining operation viable for the cost that they're gonna spend on it? They'll have data, but there may be cheaper, lower cost alternatives than a data warehouse, right? They may be able to get away with more of a database level kind of thing because they just don't generate a lot of data or they're a really super small company or they're in startup mode or they're using public data that they're just gonna be running queries against, right? The myth. Data mining requires a separate, dedicated database. Well, you know, the reality is that because of advances in database technology now, a dedicated database is not required, but there are data warehouse speciality databases that you can buy either from Oracle, from SQL, Microsoft, from uh, MySQL actually has a data warehouse style. You can do this in the cloud with very specific data warehousing kinds of things, but those are really geared towards huge data sets, terabit or petabit sized databases. So most databases now will work with some kind of analytics package. Uh, it's just gonna be a different schema. And that's really all it is. The database engine itself is pretty solid. The myth, only those with advanced degrees can do data mining. Oh, that is so not true. Right? And anyone, as long as you understand how to ask a question of a database, as long as you understand some basic SQL, you can do this. Anyone can do it. You can even do it by drag and drop. You can do it by context. So newer web-based tools will enable managers of all educational levels to do data mining. The problem is, is when someone says, I want to see it all, and they try to get the whole database onto their screen because that will happen because they want to see all the data. I don't want to miss anything. I want to see all the data. So that's a real common mistake that all new people make when they get into this, trying to see all the data. And it can be a lot of data and it can just basically halt your entire database along the way. So make sure that you page the output, right? I <laughs> really do. That's a great, great graceful way of doing it. Someone's going to say they want all the data, just page the output, only return 25 lines per page. And after a while, they get tired of flipping through it. So that way you're not trying to dump a terabit of data down the pipe to someone's computer. You're only dumping 25 lines at a time. It's a really classic way of doing things and just say, oh, well, that's how the software was made. Managers will believe that. All right, the myth. Data mining is only for large firms that can have a lot of customer data. That's not necessarily true. The reality is that the data accurately reflects the business or its customers. Any company can use data mining, and it doesn't have to be piles and piles of data. It doesn't have to be terabits or petabits of data. It can be gigabits of data, especially if you're small and you're getting started and you just don't have that data yet, or you're working with a public data set. Um, that's out there and any one of the open source public data sets out there like census data or otherwise, um, you can use that data mining techniques on it. You can actually do some neat things using public data to help your company along the way. Just understand that public data is subject to change without notice, um, alteration or other things that may not be necessarily reflective of the data that you need now. Again, census data can get really old really fast because people move around a lot more and we only do the census once every 10 years. So on this one, in summary, again, review the chapter highlights for this and review the key terms and then do your weekly homework. And thank you for being part of chapter four lecture. I am really having fun with this and I hope you are too. And I will see you in the next lecture.